<laughs> you know, Katie, last night wasn't exactly a great Look show for the you. Sacramento Kings. However, I thought there were definitely some bright spots. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, and I've been watching it now the last few games, is coming into the second half of the season, DeMontis Sabonis is so crafty in the post. Do you think they should be calling more offense for him down low? I think they have been calling more offense for him down low. And it's not, listen, the way their offense work, it's not necessarily about making calls. I mean, they, they put so much faith in both Domas and De'Aaron to read defenses, to make decisions, to get the right shots for people. But I, I would say over about the last eight to 10 games, what I've noticed is how defenses are trying to change how they're guarding DeMontis Sabonis. We saw so many double teams on him, no matter if he was operating out of the low post or the elbows during the first, let's say, 40 games, 45 games of the season. And recently what teams are doing is they're opting to try and go with single coverage because he's so good at facilitating and getting open looks for other people. And whenever you double team, no matter who it is or where you're double teaming out of, you really leave yourself susceptible defensively. So that's why we've kind of seen an uptick in his scoring recently, because especially when he's on the low block, they're opting to single coverage. And so he's doing what, you know, he should. He's reading the defense correctly, and if they're not going to double-team him, then he's going to, to take it himself. And I would say nine times out of ten, like, he's got a fairly good shot of single-coverage defense when he is on the low block underneath the basket, and he's done really well. Katie Christensen joining us. Also, Katie, we're going to kind of have this theme for the next three days. Uh, isn't it also time, as we head into the second half, maybe anything's possible, but maybe for Kings fans to just kind of adjust the expectations that have been building, like this is probably not a three seed. This is probably a five or a six seed. Everybody else loaded up or most teams loaded up. The Kings have serious deficiencies. No matter what, it's going to be uh, a better year than most of us dream. But uh, Phoenix is a better team and they lost to Phoenix. And that's what happened, right? Is it that simple? Um. I mean, yeah, I guess you can kind of say that. Uh, first of all, it, what's wild about it is we think about the uh, post-All-Star uh, portion of the season is the second half. They've played, what, 56 right. games, and, and they have 26 games left, right? right? You, through 56 games, are sitting in the three seed, and despite the loss last night to Phoenix, who was in the four seed, you still have the advantage. You still have a little bit of a cushion. So the great thing about what they have been able to do through the first 56, if you will, is they have been able to build a little bit of a cushion for themselves, which the thing for me is it's, I don't know if it's about adjusting expectations. It's about realizing what the expectations were in the beginning, right? The expectations, I think for a lot of people coming in, it was like, this is probably going to be a play-in team, right? They're going to be in that play-in from seven to 10, uh, you know, portion of, of, of the standings. And the fact that they have been in the third seed for so long and maintain that position, um, and really, especially considering, you know, that seven game road trip right before the all-star break coming back from all-star and playing uh, you know, Dallas twice and Phoenix once going in, that is the most difficult portion of the NBA schedule. And they were still able to maintain their three seed. So I think, you know, you, you've got to look at it for what it is. Like they, they managed really, really well, the hardest portion of the season and maintaining where they are in the bracket. But when you look at the, the trade deadline and what happened, you know, Phoenix last night, as soon as they acquired Kevin Durant in that trade, they became the odds on favorite to win the Western conference. And it's between them and Boston is what, you know, all of the odds makers are saying now, but between them and Boston to win the title this year, that's how good Kevin Durant is. And all of us that follow the NBA, we know it. It's not, you know, we're completely aware of what his talents can do to a team that you're also adding to Devin Booker and Chris Paul. And you look at last night's game and I thought the Kings really did a good job of, of hanging in there and really battling on the road, considering Devin Booker has just had the longest rest ever. It's fresh. Uh, Chris Paul has, I think, been back 10 games since he missed a huge portion of the season. So, you know, it, it's not like they're all operating at the same, you know, level in your tank, if you will. 
So y- you never know what you know, the next 26 games are going to do. I think the most important thing for the Kings to focus on and, and for uh, fans to really kind of, you know, I believe in what you put out in the world, like the synergy, right, is uh, health. Health is the most important thing for the Kings. And, <clears throat> excuse me, if they're able to, to be in that top six and not in the plan, I would be extremely, extremely happy considering they've done that in an 82 game season where it can just get so brutal. Katie Christensen joining us from the Folsom Lake Honda hotline, Folsom Lake Honda, your one-stop Honda shop. Katie, the team's three point shooting has struggled as of late. How much do you attribute that to the tired legs theory and that this team just needs, you know, the all-star break to really get back into shape? About 95% of it in my mind. Yeah. I think it's, it's legs. It's being tired. Um, also kind of what I was talking about a little bit earlier with how they're defending Domas. Um, they're not getting as many open looks as they were before because they're not seeing as many double teams here over the last 10 or so games. So that's part of it. But honestly, like the Kings are in a good spot. And since that, you know, they played last night in Phoenix. There's teams that are playing tonight and tomorrow night and then going into their break. So they don't play again until the 23rd. So they have a really extended break. They have a, you know, they got a couple bonus days off as well. And so I think that that's going to serve them really well. But I do believe that a lot of their three point shooting kind of woes as of late have been just tired legs. And and four fifths of that starting lineup is going to be an all star weekend with those tired legs. That being said, we were talking about how great it is for the players, but Jay was trying to describe for me what the advantage is from a fan and franchise standpoint having your players at the all-star game katie we know it's great for them and we know as fans we want to see them and you know you want that national i i get it i'm saying from a purely cynical point of view my question was if these guys need rest isn't having 80 percent of your starting lineup there doing media doing photo shoots doing the games doing the contests counterproductive i can see the argument and that for sure and i guess you know when you say is it greater or less than if you just look at it, at it from that pers- perspective it's greater to have, you know, the guys that are really getting a break um, less than when you consider that they have responsibilities there, but it's not the responsibilities. Uh, it's not like practices. It's not shoot arounds. It's not, it's not, we've all seen the all-star game. It's not a ton of, um, sure. you know, you know, hardcore basketball that you're going to see in, from a physical perspective. Right. Um, and, you know, they've got, they you know, it's again, you know, they played on Tuesday, all this action starts on Friday. So they've got a, a few days right there. Um, and I, I have to point this out. We kind of did a bad job on the broadcast. We had talked about it before, but never got a way to work it in. Um, everyone keeps talking about how there's four people. There's really five. We've got to give Nini his, his flowers too. Like uh, Nini Escada is going to be representing the Stockton um, Kings on the G League side of the all-star um, activities. And well, so, fine, you let's know, play that game. Then there's six because Scott Freshour is going to be the MC, so we can keep going. <laughs> well, he's always so great at that. Yes. We know Fresh. He has a boundless energy. But no, you know, it's the three point competition. It's the, you know, it's, it's the um, rising stars challenge. It's, it's obviously not as good as having the time off, but this is how I look at it. You know, we've talked and I've come on the show and ranted about the lack of national coverage that yeah. the team is getting. And I understand all of the factors that go into it. This is a team that hasn't made um, the playoffs in 16 years. I understand that. Then the argument was there's no all-stars. Well, first of all, that, that, that argument didn't carry much weight with me because DeMontis Sabonis is already a two-time all-star before it, he got named um, this year. But De'Aaron Fox is now an all-star. It's like from, there's some part of it where you kind of have to be involved in these things. So that over time, your team is going to start getting more respect and the respect that they need, which includes national coverage of this team, which they desire. This is the the top scoring team in the NBA. They have two all-stars. They have one of the best three-point, really, to be honest, if you think about it, three of the best three-point shooters in the league statistically. And Keegan Murray, who going into last night's game, was fourth in the NBA 
um, since January 1st in terms of three-point field goal percentage of people that are high volume that had over 110 attempts. He was the top three-point shooter in the month of December. Um, Harrison Barnes the same way since things turned around for him in January. And then Kevin Herter, who started out the season on fire and is still at 40% for his three-point shooting, even though it's kind of taken a dip as of, as of late. So, I mean, there there's a lot of things about this team where when you talk to people on a national level, they're like, this team is fun to watch. It's like, yeah, I know. I watch them every single game. It's just a lot of the the country doesn't get an opportunity unless they're paying for league pass. So I look, I, I'm, I'm looking at those things as like, okay, hopefully this means that you know, maybe we pick up a national game or two over the course of the, the rest of the season. Um, but also, this is what it, it's going to pay off next year. So these guys are just, you know, they're, they're paying the all-star price. It must be terrible. Yeah, must be terrible. Katie Christensen will not be terrible on Friday, I would think. She will join us from 7 to 11 as we, uh, you know, shift around hosts as everybody's taking vacations here and there. I don't know. I know Katie will be in studio. No confirmation as to whether or not she'll let us turn the cameras on. Oh, uh, I guess that'll be a surprise on Friday to see how she feels about that. But you know what Katie wants, Katie gets. Dave, you are a whiny baby. I, Can we just? Yeah. Thanks right. for saying baby and not another <laughs> word. Yeah, she didn't want to say baby. Uh, thank you, dear. Appreciate it. Looking forward to seeing you on Friday. All right, guys. Have a good morning. All right. Take care. That is Katie Christensen. We're way late for a break. When we come back, let's continue that conversation. We also have some more all-star facts for you as well. Sean Salisbury 